Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, Welcome to session number four of our workshop on knowledge guided machine learning, which deals with weather and climate. Um, Libby and I, who are moderating the session, will introduce ourselves in a second, but we just wanted to point out again, over here on the right of the slide, um, there's a slider link. Please use it. We really welcome questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, just type them in there. If you want to do it anonymously, you can do that too, or you can do that with your name. So with that, next slide, please. So our, my name is Imre ebert Upov, and I'm a research professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I'm also the machine learning lead for the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere, both at Colorado State University. Um, and maybe more importantly, I have been in the area of data science and climate and weather for about 10 years. And my name is Elizabeth Barnes, and I'm an associate professor in atmospheric science at Colorado State University. And while my training is really on the atmospheric science side, the past few years, I've done quite a bit of work with my group on thinking about data science tools, including machine learning and knowledge guided machine learning to do climate and weather science. Um, and Emma and I are close collaborators and lucky enough to introduce this session on knowledge guided machine learning for weather and climate. So before we jump into this topic of knowledge guided machine learning for weather and climate, we wanted to talk a little bit about what exactly we mean by what, what is included in knowledge guided machine learning. So as you see on the top left over here, we define knowledge guided machine learning to be any method that connects scientific knowledge and machine learning. And this includes specifically methods that add scientific knowledge to machine learning algorithms, but also methods that extract scientific knowledge using machine learning and any combination of the above. Next slide. What is not KGMA? Well, there are only hundreds of examples of successful use of machine learning and weather and climate, but most of them are purely data-driven. So pure machine learning is already used for some of the applications listed here are not KGML if the approach is purely data-driven and not using or extracting scientific knowledge. So then it's not KGML. Next slide. Um, just especially for those of you who might not be in the area of uh, weather and climate, we just wanted to give you a little bit of background as to what's special about weather and climate. And on this side, we have data. On the next side, we have specific machine learning challenges. So some sample data sources on weather and climate are observations from the ground, space-borne observations, complex climate models, and simplified numerical models. And also to give you an idea of the data amounts, they range from very few to a very large volume. So a climate model output can deliver 20 petabytes of data. But if you're studying smoke profiles, you might only have 10 fires per year. Next slide, please. So again, what are some of the challenges of using machine learning for weather and climate? So on the left-hand side, you see lots of challenges that are just based on the process and the data. So the Earth is a very complex system. So you have complex interactions in, in the Earth system at many different scales. Data is often multi-scale and multi-source. Processes are spatial temporal, and you have objects with fuzzy boundaries. So for example, if you have a classic image processing problem of finding cats and dogs, it's very easy to figure out where the cat ends and the dog starts. If you have a heat wave, it's much harder to figure out where exactly does the heat wave end. If you look on the very right side, what's in blue over here, we wanted to point out that many decisions in, in boys on climate are really life death decisions. So you may have to make decisions on the spot whether you should evacuate people in one area or another. Furthermore, machine learning methods are fairly new in most climate and weather applications and most atmospheric scientists are not trained in statistics or computer science. So it's really not surprising that meteorologists do not like to use tools they do not understand because at the end of the day, they're responsible for those life just decision making. So we have all these challenges, but as you see here at the bottom, we also have something that can help us a lot. Namely, atmospheric science have collected centuries of knowledge. And so we can put that to good use to try to address some of the challenges over here. Next slide, please. So how can knowledge guide machine learning help? If you add knowledge to machine learning, it can help in a variety of ways. It aligns methods more with what atmospheric scientists are already using. And if you remember that they're not used to statistics and machine learning, that's really helpful. 
It can also compensate for small sample size, which we often encounter. Remember, only 10 fires in one summer. It can help for faster convergence of your machine learning model. Uh, it can generate, quite often, knowledge guide machine learning methods can generalize better outside of the training data or task. And they can ensure that the machine learning output is physically meaningful. Furthermore, methods for extracting knowledge from machine learning can increase transparency of machine learning models. And you might also gain into new scientific insights, which come, might come in the way of causal connections, spatial patterns and important precursors, or PDE rep representations. So if you combine all this together, you get some potential advantages that are pretty important. Number one, you might increase performance reliability of your machine learning models. Number two, you might increase trust in machine learning methods by words on climate scientists who have to make this life and death decisions. And number three, you might get new scientific insights. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, we're looking here at some sample masses for adding knowledge to machine learning. And this is what we call the forward direction because you're adding scientific knowledge to the machine learning problem. Some sample methods include incorporating physical constraints into machine learning methods and other ways to help the system generalize outside of the training range. And you will see Tom Buechler talking about this in presentation number four today. Uh, another method is to use transfer learning or meta learning, which allows knowledge gained in one domain to be transferred to another domain. And you will see Shay Wang touching on this topic. And in fact, you can look at the last one as being something that goes in both directions because you're extracting knowledge and you're also adding it somewhere else. Next slide, please. So in the reverse direction, you use your machine learning to extract knowledge, scientific knowledge from the data. And some sample methods include using explainable AI, for example, neural network visualization tools to explore knowledge identified by the machine learning model. And you will see both Kirsten Meyer and Maria Molina talking about those topics. Secondly, there's using causal discovery to extract causal relationships. And you will see Maria Kretschmer talking about causal inference and causal discovery. And another example is using machine learning methods to learn a system uh, partial differential equations from data. And you saw Laura Zana giving a great talk about this in the opening session. So these are just some examples. Of course, there are more, but this gives like a good overview of some primary methods and how they're relating to the presentations you will see today. So I'm hoping this will give you kind of a big picture overview of what you will see. Next slide, please. Okay, so Emma and I hope to introduce, um, introduce this session and we thought it might be fun to tell a little bit about some of the work that we are doing here at Colorado State University as a way of introducing, um, again, these topics uh, of KGML that you're going to hear about the rest of this afternoon. So two key methods that are used by our groups are causal discovery and explainable AI. And in terms of causal discovery, which again, Marlena, it will talk quite a bit more about in the coming session, um, Emma's actually been you know, working in the field of causal discovery and climate research for almost a decade now. And we, um, as, a, as a two groups, have really come together to do um, some work recently thinking about sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction in this sphere of causal connections, uh, thinking about how tropical storms, for example, may influence mid-latitude storms or the stratospheric polar vortex in the coming days to weeks. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this here other than um, these types of causal networks and trying to extract these relationships or teleconnections from one point on the globe to another is something we'll be hearing more about um, in the later session or in the later talk. And the second, as I said, the second key method used by our groups is really explainable AI. And this is where we have quite a bit of activity going on right now. So we thought it would be fun to, to give you a, a bit of a flavor for what type of work we mean by explainable AI. It has a really cool acronym with an XAI, but what does that really mean, right? So here we're just gonna focus on our work on neural network visualization. Specifically, our favorite method right now is called layerwise relevance propagation. And while we did not come up with or invent this tool, we are finding incredibly helpful for doing weather and climate science with machine learning, specifically with neural networks. So just big picture, to introduce this method. Um, let's start with an artificial neural network. We've already heard about convolutional neural network and LSTMs. Um, just at its basic form though, a neural network really is data going in to this network of, of connections between different values. So it's really, you know, in essence, um, a feed forward network is like regression 
um, and it outputs a prediction. Now, the complexity and nonlinearities inside of this network allow it to learn many different pathways of predictable behavior, and we've already seen wonderful examples of how that can lead to, to better predictions. But a big question as scientists is, how did the network make its prediction? What did it learn? How did it do such a good job? And the scientists were often wondering why. We don't want to just make a prediction. We then want to understand why we were able to make a prediction. And so what can we expect from ne neural network visualization? Um, I love this example that, that Emma came up with here. So just like a black backpack going through an x-ray scanner, at first, when you look at the black backpack, you can't see anything that's inside. Same with this idea of a black box neural network. Now, when you put the backpack through the x-ray scanner, what you get out is not a perfect view of the contents of the backpack, but it's certainly better than what you started with. And that's how we think a lot about our neural network visualization techniques. They're not going to give us everything that's going on inside, but they're going to give us an inside view that's certainly better than the black box. And then, of course, the question is, how can we use this for science? So layer-wise relevance propagation is a tool that our groups are really using a lot these days. And here's the basic overarching concept. Let's say you have a classification problem where you input an image and you want to know the probability that, you know, there, is there a cat in my image? So in this example, we have one specific image of our cat and we've already trained our network. So now we're going to put this image through our trained network and output the probability that there's a cat in this image. Now what layer-wise relevance propagation does is it takes that probability and it propagates it back through the network such that the output is a heat map, which you can see here um, with the red, the red dots on the left-hand side. So here it is shown again. And what this heat map tells you, it's, it's the relevant regions of the input for the network's prediction. So the idea is when the network made its prediction of the probability of it, that it was a cat, these are the regions that the network placed most of its focus. So here's a fun example use of, of LRP that came out of the group who, who um, invented this, this technique. So here's our task. Everybody, here's your task. I want you to decide whether there is a horse in each of these images. OK, so a, a network was tasked. The CNN was tasked with this very job. And it got them all right. It figured out that there was a horse in each one of these three images. And as humans, hopefully, you've all also agreed there's a horse in each of these images. But now we can use LRP to ask, how did the network figure out there was a horse? I know how I knew there was a horse, but how did the network figure this out? So what we can do is push each of these images through and propagate um, their relevance back to create a heat map. And here's the heat map output by LRP, where the red regions are the regions that were most relevant for the network's prediction that there was a horse. Now, you might be surprised because the reddest or brightest, warmest regions are not where the horse is, but they're in the bottom left-hand corner of every image. And if you look closely, you'll realize that is where the copyright symbol is for this particular set of images. That is, the network has learned that when it sees this copyright symbol, it's probably a horse. Okay, and, and in most applications, this is not what you wanna happen, right? We want it to learn for the right reasons. And in this case, I think, at least I would say this is learning the wrong, for the wrong reasons here. So now we're going to go through two examples of how we are using this, um, this method to do science in weather and climate. All right, so you've seen horses, you've seen cats. So the next question is how can we use LRP in weather and climate? So here's a uh, weather example and next comes a climate example from Libby. So this is some of the work we've been doing where we've been trying to generate synthetic radar images from satellite imagery. Why would we want to do that? Well, satellite imagery is widely available, for example, in all of the continental United States, but radar is not. So it would be very nifty if we could just feed into a neural network our satellite imagery and then out comes an estimate of radar imagery, specifically MIMS. So we're feeding in here four different channels of the GOES satellite system, channel seven, nine, 13, and lightning. Um, we feed in our neural network and out comes an estimate of radar imagery. And so we trained our neural network and it was performing reason reasonably well, but then of course the question was, how does it do it? How does it come up with this estimate? So next slide, please. So of course we used our favorite method LRP for this purpose. So again, the question was, our neural network performs well, but how does it do it? What kind of strategies does it use to come up with pixel values of radar, also known as MIMS? So 
uh, what LRP can tell us is when the input is a neural network focusing when estimating large uh, values of MIMS at the output. And we used LRP, and I won't go into the details. I have the paper here on top. If you just Google Ebert Uphoff and Hilburn 2020 archive, you will find our paper, which is also about to appear in BAMS. But the key point is that we used LRP to find three different strategies by just looking where the neural network was looking. And we found that the MIMS is estimated near zero unless one of the, one of the following three things happening. Um, either there's presence of lightning, or there's presence of cloud boundaries, or there's presence of cold cloud tops, which all makes meteorological sense. So now we have a qualitative understanding of how a neural network is thinking, and we can explain it to a meteorologist. We can say, well, the neural network is going to estimate something close to zero unless it sees lightning in the GLMs channel, or it sees cloud boundaries or very cold cloud tops in the ABI channels. So again, we gain qualitative understanding, and that increases trust in the method. Next slide, please. So in Emma's example, she showed how we can use LRP to gain trust in our method. For example, the horses, we would not have trust. But in her example, we see, OK, maybe, maybe this method is actually predicting this radar image for the right reasons. In this example, I want to explain how we're using LRP to, to discover new science about the climate system, specifically thinking about climate change in the 21st century. It's really a signal to noise problem. So if you look here at this plot, this is a mean predicted change in temperatures between the beginning or between 1920 and 1939 and the end of the 21st century. So 2070 to 2099. This has been averaged over many climate models, 29 different climate models. So we get a very smooth, pretty picture. And as you can see, first of all, most everything's red or everything is red. And this is global warming, you know, the, earth, the, the earth warming up with anthropogenic emissions. And we see that some regions are, are warming up faster than others. But what's hidden in this pretty mean average picture are two sources of uncertainty. The first is structural model uncertainty or model disagreement. And the fact that we have many different climate models that all simulate the physics of the climate system differently. That's all been hidden because I've averaged over all of these models. And the second is the concept of internal variability or climate noise. The fact that on any given day, on any given year, the climate system has a certain amount of noise associated with it that we will never be able to predict. And again, that's all hidden in this one um, average plot. Now this is nice and we can make this plot, but the issue is the real world is not an average of 29 different climate models. It's really just one of these. So when we look at something like observed present day trends in temperature, how can we tell which changes are the signal in this picture and which, which trends that we see or changes are the noise in our single one observed earth? So, uh, we, we got together and thought about this and, and came up with sort of a funny, a funny setup that's turned out to be really helpful in thinking about um, cl climate change patterns. So specifically what we did is we set up our network to train something incredibly boring. We are training our network to predict the year of a map. So everybody in your head, think about the year you were born. Somebody could have made a temperature, a global temperature map of that year. What I wanna do is I want you to be able to feed that map into a neural network and I want it to predict. Um, in this case, we're doing fuzzy classification, but you could think of it as a regression problem as well. I wanna predict the decade, if you will, that that map came from, okay? Now, right now for this example that I'm gonna show, we're gonna train and test on climate model output. So we do have data everywhere for every year. So if you stop and think about this for a while, and it really took me a while to think about it, um, you figure out that the network has to learn regional signals that are reliable indicators of the year in order to do this problem well, in order to predict the year correctly. And this is hard because of all the noise in the climate system. It needs to learn the patterns of forced change in order to predict um, the, the year correctly from a single map. So we trained our network and it turned out it did okay. So um, that's shown here where the actual year of the map that we fed the network is on the x-axis and the predicted year is on the y. So a perfect guess is going to be along that one-to-one -one line. You might notice the different colors. Well, the gray dots, which are hard to see, were our training simulations, and the colored dots were the climate models that were only used for testing and validation. So a few cool things that we saw is, first of all, the, the neural network doesn't do a very good job for the first few decades of our simulations up until about 1960. And that's because the climate change signal is so weak 
that it's unable to figure out what year it is because of all of the noise. But then around 1960 or so, the network finds regional patterns that tell it what year it is, and it's able to do a relatively reasonable job in predicting the year from then on into the 21st century. And you can see it does a better and better job as we go further and further into the 21st century because the climate change signal becomes stronger and stronger in comparison to the noise. Now, I will mention that climate models are wonderful tools, but they have issues. And so it's possible that our neural network could learn wonderful things from climate models that have absolutely nothing to do with the real world. So as a test, once we've trained our model, our, our neural network, we then take maps from the observed Earth, the real, the real world we live in today, and we push those through the network and we say, guess what year it is? And those, are shown, those guesses are shown in the white dots here. And what you can see is it gets the year generally correct. Now that's very exciting in my view, because what that tells us is what the neural network has learned from these climate model simulations is applicable to the real world. Okay, so I've just made a big deal about predicting the year. And you should not be terribly impressed because we all know what year it is and we all knew what year it was. So what have we really done here? Well, this is not the exciting part. The exciting part is now using layer-wise relevance propagation to figure out what the neural network learned in order to predict the year in the first place. That is, we have our network set up on the top here, but we can now propagate backwards through the network using LRP and ask which regions are relevant for correctly predicting a specific year. So for example, we've done this and for the year 2015, these are the relevant regions shown as the dark red colors for predicting the year from a map of, of surface temperature. And I mean, we, I could talk a lot about what all these different patterns mean. We see the Southern Ocean jumping out, for example, regions over Asia and the North Atlantic. But these start to tell us where those forced um, components or where temperature is responding in a way that makes it relevant to know the year. Now we can do this for more than just 2015. We can do this for lots of different decades. For example, I've sh I'm showing 1995 through 2095 here. And what we can see is because the network is nonlinear, um, it's able to pick up time changing patterns of forced change. That is the 1995 picture does not look like the 2095 picture. But you also see some very interesting signals. For example, we believe that this relevant region over um, Southeast Asia in 2015 may be related to aerosols. Um, being output because they peak during, during those decades. You'll also see that the Arctic does not play a substantial role in telling us what year it is, because although the Arctic warms substantially um, with climate change, it's also very noisy and climate models tend to disagree on the actual response. And so the neural network has learned to ignore the Arctic and look elsewhere when determining what year it is. So those are just two ways that, that we've been using um, explainable AI to think about science and do new science, as well as um, have, um, have faith in, in what our networks are actually learning and making sure they make physical sense. Uh, but those are just uh, some examples of how KGML is being used in, in our groups and in weather and climate. And now what you're really here for is to listen to our upcoming speakers. So we have a great set of five, you know, really rising leaders in this field of KGML for um, weather and climate, who are going to talk about a variety of ways, both the forward and the backward direction um, in, in, a, in adding and extracting knowledge from these, from these tools. And finally, just as a reminder, um, you can find all of this on our website, but I will just note that our break is from 2.40 to 3 o'clock rather than 2.50, as it says on the website. And Emma, anything to add before we move on? To One our thing I think we should add is that we didn't properly acknowledge our NSF sponsorship. So if you wouldn't ah. mind going back to slide number one, all the way, if you could. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge NSF sponsorship for this. And um, as you know, this is all part of a bigger um, project that we have at the University of Minnesota with the other universities that I mentioned here on top. So I don't want to neglect that. Thank you. And with that, should we move on to the first presentation? We are actually five minutes ahead of schedule.
I think there's some questions. So maybe we take some questions since we have five minutes. That's just fine. Okay. So there's one question here that says, regarding guess what year it is, if you train it using paleo diet, assuming you had such, would it break the neural network? Um, I, well, if we trained it with paleo data, I don't, I'm not sure what, how it would break it. If we, if we actually had that data, I think it would just, it, it could help. Well, because paleo climate does have very large cycles that are being forced externally from say the solar cycle um, and, and, and larger, larger forcings than just um, the, just the climate noise, I think it could actually learn something. One thing we have done is we have tried to train it with a climate model simulation that has no forcing in it whatsoever. So in essence, it should fail because there is nothing to learn about the year. And indeed, as expected, it fails miserably. All right. Another question, have you compared your result on slide 29 to a simple sorting based on global annual mean temperature? Ah, yes. So for those of you familiar, you might say, well, hold on a second. We know every year the climate gets warmer. So the neural network could just be taking the mean temperature over the globe to help it um, predict the year. So in first answer, our network does better than just the global mean temperature. But more importantly, um, I didn't show these results, but a big part of our paper is taking the global mean signal out. So it was, so every year's map has a mean of zero. So in that way, we force the network to only learn the regional patterns and relationships in response to climate change. And what surprised me is it does quite well, um, almost as well as what you just saw, saw, suggesting that it is not only relying on the global mean temperature um, to, to make its prediction. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Layerized relevance propagation looks like a great tool. Any thoughts on how it could be used to look into processes? Emma, would you like, I've done a lot of talking. Would you like to answer? I, I can also better answer. want to answer that question now. I think that's for you. Yeah, so, okay. So in terms of processes, I think we could sit and brainstorm quite a few. I believe our next speaker, Kirsten, is going to start talking about specific, specific processes that we expect as scientists relate one region of the globe to predictions in another. And she will be using LRP to make these predictions or to understand these predictions. So I think in that sense, our next speaker is going to be a great example of how we can use this to understand processes. Um, it can also be helpful if you have a network where you've input lots of things you think might be important in terms of processes and mechanisms, and you output a prediction and it gets it right, you can use LRP to go back through the network and ask which of those inputs were most helpful. For example, um, was it soil moisture or was it um, surface temperature or precip that helps me predict this future state of the atmosphere or Earth's surface. So, um, but I think our next speaker is going to be a great example of that. So with that, I would say we can look at some of the remaining questions in the panel session at the end. And it sounds like a perfect transition to Kirsten's talk. <laughs>